I was one of the wardens, as Nicky was saying, at the Tower of London, around about the same time Nicky was there. And I used to look after the crown jewels. I was there in the jewel house, wearing the uniform, the red-trimmed frock coat and gold-trimmed uh, top hat of a warden of the crown jewels. It's the uh, royal, uniform of the royal household. And uh, during my time there, and back at now again since Covid, we're getting about three million people going through the jewel house. Every day. Every year. Every now you spotted you spotted my deliberate mistake. You've seen all these faces today, I thought three three million per, per year. Now eighty percent of those three million per year were from overseas, not from the United Kingdom. So they come Americans, Europeans, people from all corners of the globe come to see the Crown Jewels. It's a pity, I mean I live in the east end of London, a lot of people who live just round the corner from me. They've never been to the tower and it's only a mile away, you know. And if they live in the borough tower hamlets, then get in for a pound. Because they pay rates, because the tower is actually in tower hamlets. It's on the border of the city of London, but it's just within tower hamlets. At one time, of course, the Tower Liberties, the tower was its own, was in charge of everything in, within the liberties of the tower. Neither the city council or anybody else were responsible for them. Anyway, let's get back to the tower. Uh, so we had to answer questions, and uh, first of all, everyone post one in the jewel house, I used to say, welcome to Her Majesty's jewel house, as it was then. Remember, there's no eating, no drinking, no shouting, no swearing, no misbehaviour, no digital images, no filming, no photography. But please do enjoy yourselves. <laughs> so that's what I had to say to them. <clears throat> now, when you go to the tower... It's not just one tower. The main tower is the White Tower, uh, built on the orders of William the Conqueror, completed in stone around 1078, um, of Carn stone and Kentish ragstone. When this huge tower appeared, looming over the city of London, where most people, uh, the Saxon dwellers, lived in little wooden houses, this showed them the power of the Normans, who had now come to rule over England. And lots of famous things happened in this chapel. Uh, the present king, who we all feel, we all hope he gets better soon, uh, the present king had his um, Holy Communion in this chapel of St John the Evangelist, the oldest Norman chapel in England, and he had his Holy Communion on the day of his 21st birthday. Lots of things happened. If I, if I go back to uh, 1399, uh, King Henry IV created Knights of the Bath. And why does it have the name Bath? What's that got to do with being a knight? Well, all the knights in those days, especially those who were going to accompany the king on the parade through the, uh, the city of London, through the open fields where the Strand is now to Westminster Abbey, where the coronation took place, those knights, and 46 of them he appointed in 1399, um, came in and in the room adjacent there were 46 bathtubs where while they were scrubbing away and cleaning themselves, this was cleansing them physically and also cleansing them spiritually. The king would come in and make the sign of the cross on their back and he would knight them knights of the, the order of the bath. The bath, order of the bath still exists today and many prominent people are knights of the bath, but not, um, it's not as high as the highest order. Highest order of chivalry, what's that? Oops. And the order of the garter, yes but it's still a quite impressive position. And they came in this in their white robes and prayed in, in the tower. Then they put their shiny uh, armour on and they accompanied the king and queen on the big parade through the city of London where the conduits were flowing with free red wine for the inhabitants of the city of London to drink. So, of course, they were very happy to have a few drinks and cheer the royal party on to the coronation. <clears throat> Now you see a playing card in the corner there, and on the uh, 3rd of February, 1553, Elizabeth of York, she was the wife of Henry VII, and sadly, she gave birth to a baby girl in the White Tower, where they were residing at the time, and then she died of child in childbirth herself, and her husband, King Henry VII although he was very uh, careful with money, he did open the coffers and uh, 
gave her a splendid funeral. But for several days, she lay in this chapel, surrounded by a thousand candles. Can you imagine? Now, Elizabeth of York was the daughter of Edward IV and Queen Elizabeth Woodville of the House of York, sister of Edward V, one of the princes in the Tower, niece of King Richard III, who may be responsible, some think, people think he is responsible, for the death of the two princes, of course, the wife of Henry VII, and the mother of the most famous king in English history. Who do you think that was? King Henry VIII, that's right. And when she married Henry VII, Henry Tudor, it sort of ceremonially brought an end to the wars of the roses between the houses of Lancaster and York. And uh, it's sad that she didn't live to a great age. Now there's 19 dual house wardens, or there was when I was there. That's me standing at the front with Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth, His Late, Ma His late Royal Highness Prince Philip, and they just opened... Tower Hill, the new Tower Hill. It was completely refurbished um, in 2004. Were you there then, Nick? Were you there then? And the Queen came along and, and opened it, and then she had a meal in the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers building, and there's the, uh, the 19 uh, Jewel House Wardens. So it was a splendid occasion. It's much nicer now. It's paid, this work that they did in Tower Hill tidied it all up, put all the new ticket offices in, paid for by the Heritage Lottery Fund, and... Um, money from the late Sir John Paul Getty. So, um, Sir John Paul Getty had died just before it was reopened, but his wife, Lady Getty, was there. Lady Getty unveiled the plaque, and so did Her Majesty, Her Late Majesty the Queen. So it was quite a day that day. And you don't see 19 jewel house wardens when you go through the jewel house, because we're all on the shift pattern. The Tower of London, when I was there, and I think it's the same today, is open every day of the year, apart from Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's, Boxing Day and New Year's Day. Every other bank holiday we are open to the public. The public come at weekends and in bank holidays. So we have to be there uh, when the public come in. And when I used to look at my roster when I worked at the Tower, I used to think, uh, how many bank holidays have I got off the, this year? And apart from the ones at Christmas, invariably, there were none. Now, we come to the good stuff now. The Crown Jewels. Approximately 25,000 precious stones in the collection, and they have been kept at the, in the jewel house at the Tower of London since 1303. Originally, they were kept at Westminster Abbey. Does anybody know why they moved them to the Tower of London? Security. And one fact was that uh, they went. Somebody went to Westminster Abbey, and they found Bishop Wenlock and the monks. It was a Catholic a Catholic Abbey in those days. They found the monks were wearing nice designer suits, you know, driving flashy sports cars, booking foreign holidays. Where was the money coming from? They were helping themselves to the jewels. So the jewels were perfectly safe when they moved them to the tower until 1649. Then what happened then? Tried to steal them. Who? Somebody tried to steal them. No, 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 they didn't. No, it wasn't Captain Dobson. I'll tell you about that in a minute. No, it was Oliver Cromwell. We had a republic after the English Civil War from 1649 to 1660. Oliver Cromwell, during most of that time, was Lord Protector of England. King Charles I was executed on the 30th of January, 1649. And he was executed just outside the Banqueting House in Whitehall, which is another uh, royal palace that belongs to historic royal palaces, which I used to work for. And uh, so there we are. Terrible. He was the only king ever, ever executed. But he, Cromwell ordered that most of the crown jewels should be sold off or melted down. He kept a few of them, I believe. So they were, most of the crown jewels were remade for the restoration of the monarchy under King Charles II in 1660. Now I'm going to test you on this little poem. Have you got a pencil and a bit of paper to write it all down? And it goes like this. Willie, Willie, Henry, Steve, Henry, Dick, John, Henry III. One, two, three, Ned's Richard, Richard two. Henry's four, five, six, then who? Edward, four, five, Dick the bad. Harry's twain, then Ned the lad. Mary, Bessie, James the vain. Charlie, Charlie, James again. William and Mary, and Gloria. Four Georges, William, then Victoria. Ned, George, Ned, George. Now it's seen, a second Bessie was our queen. But now, in recent years, as we have heard, our present monarch, is King Charles III. Mm. 
So remember that and I'll be testing you later. After, when you go into the jewel house, you go through the Hall of Monarchs, it's been slightly altered now. We used to have all the kings and queens of England, 41 of them, since uh, William the Conqueror, and um, their dates of their reigns. But now we have different images of different monarchs. And then you go into three cinemas with high-definition television images. Now, some people come through and say, do we see the jewels? Of course you do. It's a queuing system that was copied from Disney World, actually. And you walk around and you see all these films. But do, do, do go in that way and do see the movies because they zoom into the jewels and you get a much better of the image of the various artefacts than you, work, you do when you actually get into the jewel house. So you go through these three movies and one is, uh, also shows the Queen's coronation. They may, have altered it. they may have altered it now. I haven't been since the last coronation, so they may have put King Charles's coronation on it. I don't know. But uh, if you go there, you will see. And then you go through what they call the Hall of Monarchs, and we have various processional, you go through the, well not the Hall of Monarchs, it's the processional way, where we have processional objects, and there's uh, ten large maces made of um, a wooden pole coated with silver gilt, silver coated with 22 karat gold. Each one commissioned by a different monarch, William and Mary, um, James II, all different monarchs have, uh, have their ciphers put on them. Two of them go out along with the imperial state crown at the state opening of parliament. A mace at one time was a close protection weapon to protect the king carried by the sergeant at arms in front of the king uh, but now it's become a ceremonial object. So in the House of Commons and the House of Lords when they're in session the mace is placed on the table. This also happens in local authorities in the town hall when the mayor goes in there's a smaller version of a mace and there's also one of these large maces in the um, Lord Chancellor and Minister of Justice's office to show that all legislation and justice are carried out in the name of the Crown. Then you go through two large vault doors weighing three tons either side and it's opened every morning and closed every night. I'm not going to tell you the combination. And I used to stand on this platform here answering visitors' questions. You can go around as many times as you like. And most of the main crowns and artefacts are actually on this part of the travelator. You can get, sometimes you stand there saying, go around again. Now, if we put a sign, a red rope there saying no entry, everybody would want to go around. You wouldn't have to stand there saying, please go around again. Because, but when, you, when it's free for them to go, they don't tend to go. <laughs> I've even had people come up to me and... Uh, when you're on post six, which is the last post in the jewel house, and they say, where are the crown jewels? They go on this travelator thinking at the Heathrow airport, like the clappers, and they miss everything that's there. So you have to take them back again. Now this travelator, as I just mentioned, is similar to what they have at the airports. And it's got three speeds. At uh, eight o'clock in the, nine o'clock in the morning, ten o'clock Sundays, we put it on speed one where it's going fairly slow. There's only a few tourists coming in. They can wander around, look at the jewels, chat to me or whoever's on that platform. Take the time. It comes to about 20 past 12 lunchtime. It's getting busier. Um, so we put it on speed two. And you can tell what's coming next. And then at about quarter past five, you might remember we close at 5.30. We've got to empty the jewels by 5.30. <laughs> My dinner's in the oven. And anybody who work, works in a shop knows people come in on the last minute, don't they? And they want to stay forever. So we put it on what we call warp speed, which is speed three. <laughs> One of the oldest items in the crown jewels is the coronation anointing spoon. The holy oil, which is extracts of herbs and flowers. At the recent coronation, the, herb, the um, holy oil came from Jerusalem, extracts of herbs and flowers and it was blessed there, and it was blessed at Westminster Abbey. Then it's poured onto the spoon, and the Archbishop of Canterbury anoints the monarch in the head, the chest, and the back of the hands. They're anointed by God in mind, body, and soul. The spoon, we believe, dates from 1199, which was the coronation of King John. It may even be older than that. It was one of the few items that wasn't melted down by Oliver Cromwell, because a man named Clement Kinnersley, a courtier, took it away as a souvenir. When King Charles had the crown jewels remade, he'd actually ordered a new anointing spoon, but Mr. Kinnersley gave the original one back 
to King Charles, and it's the original one that we still use. The ampulla, the head, is supposed to be 14th century, but the body of the imperial eagle is, um, we believe, 1066, 60, 1060 or 1061. I mean, sorry, 1660, 1661 for the restoration of the monarchy. The spoon is made of silver gilt with four wet, um, freshwater pearls there on it. Now this is the coronation crown. This is what we saw King Charles crowned with at the coronation. It's only worn by the monarch for about 20 minutes at each coronation. And then it will never be worn again until the next coronation. It uh, weighs five pounds of solid gold and it contains 444 semi-precious stones. Quartzes, tourmalines, and they're what they call foil stones because they put silver, coloured foil behind them to make them look more colourful. And at one time, they used to hire jewels to put in it because it's only used at the coronation, and then send them back to the jewellers. But King George V had it permanently set with these semi precious stones. It has a purple cap of maintenance, and um, you can see it's trimmed with ermine, which is an Arctic stoat with little brown bits of the ermine's tail. And this was used at the coronation. It will not be used again until the next coronation. And in fact, uh, it looks exactly the same at the front as it does at the back. And the Samoan newsreel film of Archbishop Cosmo Lang in 1937, uh, placing it on the, the late Queen Elizabeth's father's head, present king's grandfather, uh, and he was looking at the crown like this, and he wasn't sure which way to put it on. Because what he'd done, he'd put a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of cotton at the front so that he would know which was the right way when it was on the altar at Westminster Abbey. And he came up to the altar where all the crowns were to pick up the crown and some tidy person had seen this bit of cotton and said, what's that doing there? <laughs> and they'd removed it. So when he placed it on his majesty's head, he placed it on back to front. And it's quite noticeable in the, um, in the old newsreel, but it's only for 20 minutes. And then they change to the imperial state crown. Of course, they are crowned on the King Edward's chair or coronation chair, named after King Edward I. It was commissioned in 1296. The first king to be seated upon it to be crowned was King Edward II. And uh, underneath was placed the stone, stone of Scone from Scone Abbey in Scotland. The, the stone of Scone is now on display at Edinburgh Castle. I've seen it there. And it's slightly broken in the middle. It looks like a bit of concrete to me. I wasn't very impressed by it, actually. But it's supposed to have been the, the stone on which the kings of Scotland were crowned. And some people even believe it was the stone upon which King David was crowned king of Israel. We can't prove that. That's just a story. But it's, it doesn't stay in Westminster Abbey. It's, it came down, of course, for the coronation. And now it's gone back. The coronation chair is made of oak. And uh, if anybody gets close to it, you will see that it, um, graffiti is not a modern phenomenon. They didn't have spray cans in the Middle Ages, but they used to carve their names on this chair. And actually you could see it on the high definition television this time, when the king was sitting on it. All the different uh, initials from the various choir boys and visitors to Westminster Abbey who had carved their names on it. But they still use that old chair. They gave it a bit of a brush up. Uh, before the coronation and one of the pinnacles at the side was damaged uh, when a suffragette placed a bomb near there in the early 20th century. While they're seated on the coronation chair they're handed various objects like the orb which is an empty golden globe with um, diamonds, pearls, various precious stones and an amethyst holding the cross up and this symbolises Christianity throughout the world. And of course the king is the head of the Church of England. So that's their spiritual power. Their temporal or worldly power is symbolised by the, the um, sovereign sceptre. And the, um, the sceptre with the dove represents mercy. With a ceramic dove on the top. The sovereign sceptre contains the first star of Africa at the top which is 530 carats. It's the largest top quality cut diamond in the world of that quality. 
The Cullinan diamond was found at tw um, 26th of January 1905 at the Premier Mine in the Transvaal. It was 3,106 carats. And it was sent to England from the Transvaal government just after the Boer War to smooth things over with King Edward VII on his 66th birthday. The King received it, and how do you think they got the, the stone to Windsor Castle, to the King of England? They posted it, second class parcel post. And it arrived. They sent a replica, which was sent on a ship with all sorts of bands playing, all sorts of fuss. That also arrived. The king had to check which was the correct one, and he did, and then he sent the correct one to Mr. Joseph Asher of Amsterdam, who cut the jewels into nine major and 96 minor diamonds. The two biggest are in the crown jewels, first star on the scepter, second star 317 carats on the imperial state crown, and the rest in the royal collection. And in fact... At the recent coronation, um, Queen Camilla used the late Queen Mary's crown and they removed the, um, what was a, an imitation stone from the front of it and they replaced it with two of the stars of Africa, two of the lesser stars of Africa. <coughs> but I went to the tower the other day and I asked them if we could just, we could just, they could manage for a couple of days without the first star of Africa. So I brought it with me. Oh. Here it is. Isn't it? There we are. It's nice, isn't it? Oh. It's worth a lot of money, so I better get it back in. <laughs> I've got to get it back to the tower this afternoon. <laughs> Actually, this looks like a replica to me. <laughs> and it is. But you, know, you can see, you can appreciate the size of the diamond. It's a big diamond. <clears throat> So we have the first star of Africa, the second star of Africa, and the Kohinoor diamond. The Kohinoor diamond is not, it came from India, it's separate to all the other diamonds, I'll be talking about that later. It's at the front of the late Queen Mother's crown. It's 106 carats, and it was cut, uh, it, was, it was 150, over 150 carats when the last um, Maharaj of the Punjab, a nine-year-old boy, Julep Singh, presented it to Queen Victoria. It was found at the Golconda Mine in India at 1100 AD. And that is now at the front of the Queen Mother's Crown, but they didn't want to use the Queen Mother's Crown at the recent coronation because lots of people in um, the Indian subcontinent say it should be there. But it belonged to the, the uh, Mughal emperors in India, it belonged to the Shahs of Persia, it belonged to the kings of Afghanistan. All these people have a claim on it. We can't give it back to any of them because we don't know. The Punjab, half of that's in India and half is in Pakistan. So it's very difficult to give it back to anybody. So to, to avoid any fuss, they didn't use it at all. But it is still there in the jewel house. St. Edward's sapphire, a lovely sapphire in the top, cross at the top of the imperial state crown, was believed to have been worn in the coronation ring of Edward the Confessor himself in 1042. And it was he was buried wearing it. And in 1163, when they... Um, we're refurbishing Westminster Abbey. They opened the king's coffin and took the ring off the gnarled king's finger because they thought it would be more useful in some of the royal jewellery than leaving it in a coffin. And they found his body was reasonably well preserved. Uh, Edward the Confessor. Edward the Confessor. Yes. <clears throat> Edward the Confessor died in 1066, handed over to Harold. Harold lost the Battle of Hastings to William the Conqueror. And the rest, as they say, is history. So, that's, that's it. he's still there, Edward the Confessor, still lying there in Westminster Abbey. The Stuart Sapphire was sold off by Oliver Cromwell, but it managed to come back through a very convoluted way. A bishop who was related to the Stuart family, uh, uh, George IV, managed to buy it off him when they got it back. 104 carats. It used to be at the back, the front of the state crown, now it's at the back, because the second star of Africa is at the front. The Stuart Sapphire was believed to have been worn... Um, in the crown of King, one of the kings of Scotland, I'm trying to remember which one it was now. <laughs> anyway, it, was, it belonged to the kings of Scotland, it belonged to the Stuart family. Queen Mary here is wearing the first, second and third stars of Africa and the Kohinoor diamond. Queen Mary wore so much jewellery that she had her body strengthened with buckram to take the weight of the jewels. She would turn up to a dinner party in nine pearl necklaces. She was very distinguished. She didn't look over the top on Queen Mary somehow. So she was a very distinguished lady. 
the wife of King George V, and uh, she only had one problem, that she was a bit of a kleptomaniac. If she joined the war years, they sent her to various stately homes in England for safety because of the bombing in London, and she'd go to various houses and she'd say, ooh, that's very nice, and they had to give it to her, you see. So she amassed quite a collection of things that she'd been given, and when she died in early 1953, she told Queen Elizabeth, carry on with your coronation. And Queen Elizabeth tried to give a lot of these things that Queen Mary had acquired back to the various people. Some of them were still living, so she did give some of them back to the people that she'd purloined them from. <laughs> <laughs> Queen Mary was the last person to wear Queen Victoria's tiny diamond crown. It weighs a few, weighs a few ounces. She used to wear it over a widow's cap. You see the, the bun pennies and the bun stamps of Queen, Queen Victoria. After the death of King, uh, Prince Albert in 1861, she, uh, she didn't attend Parliament very often, but when she did, she wore that because it wasn't... She was only, only very, a tiny lady, four foot ten inches tall. So it was much more comfortable for a small, diminutive lady to wear that. The uh, Mary of Mo Modena's diadem is also in the jewel house. Mary of Modena, daughter of the Duke of Modena in Italy. Modena's where the balsamic vinegar comes from. And... She, just to keep you up to date. And <laughs> she wore it on her coronation procession. She was married to James II, who was the last Catholic king of England. The coronation rings, the, the larger coronation ring, has a circle of 14 diamonds, a large sapphire, and five rubies in the shape of the cross of St. George. It's known as the wedding ring of England. should really be the wedding ring of the United Kingdom. But they say wedding ring of England because... Being the monarch of this country is supposed to be a job for life. So that's why they call it that, like a marriage is supposed to be. And the smaller one was made for Queen Victoria because she only had tiny fingers. It should have been made for the wedding ring finger, but it was made for the little finger. So the Archbishop of Canterbury forced it onto the wrong finger, which caused Queen Victoria's finger to be bruised very badly, and she had to soak it in ice water several days after the coronation to get the thing off. I don't think she ever wore it again. Lots of things went wrong at Victoria's uh, coronation because there had been no um, rehearsal. It wasn't televised. There was no such thing as television in those days. But peers were tripping up over their robes and all sorts of things. She was handed the wrong objects and it all went. Luckily, the public only saw the coach going through and back again. They didn't see the service. So it didn't matter too much. And the other little ring is the um, consort's ring. The last lady to wear that with a large ruby at the front is Queen Victoria, the Queen Consort. Uh, it was made for Queen Adelaide, who was the wife of William IV, and the city of Adelaide in Australia is named after her. So here we have the um, consort's crowns. This is the one that Queen Camilla wore without this um, rock crystal that's at the front. They took that out and put the second and third stars of Africa in it for the last coronation. The Queen Mother's crown has the koh i diamond, very famous diamond there. It's supposed to be bad luck. Um, for a man, the koh because a lot of the men that owned it in India, um, it brought them bad luck. Shah Jahan, who, one of the Mughal emperors, was imprisoned by his own son. He never saw the light of day again, he never saw the koh again. So it's supposed to be bad luck for a man. Shah Jahan, in fact, was the man who built the Taj Mahal for his late wife, Mum Taj Mahal. So that's the only one crown made of platinum. That's the one we thought Queen Camilla would wear. But because of the controversy, this is the one she actually wore. The Queen Mother's crown was last used in, in 2002, wasn't it, when she died? And it was placed on her coffin. This is the crown that the King wears every year to the state opening of Parliament, and their late, late Majesty did. It was altered slightly for the King, and it's got lots of famous jewels on it. It weighs about three pounds. It's got this... St. Edward's Sapphire, Edward the Confessor's Sapphire, second star of Africa, 317 carats, four large drop pearls, known, um, known as Queen Elizabeth's earrings. We believe they were the same ones Queen Elizabeth I wore as earrings, because there's lots of paintings of her wearing these large drop pearls. The uh, Stuart Sapphire at the back, and the Black Prince's ruby at the front. The Black Prince's ruby is not a ruby at all, it's a large spinel, but it is capped with a little ruby there at the top. It was worn 
When the kings went into battle, they wore crown helmets. So they had a helmet with a crown over it. And obviously making them a great target for whoever they were fighting. A bit like Nelson on the Trafalgar with all his medals. Similar sort of thing. And it was believed to have been worn at the Battle of Agincourt, 1415, um, by King Henry, the, Henry V, and lost. And the battlefield then retrieved. It was certainly worn by Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth Field, 1485. And he, um, he was chopped to pieces, stripped naked, and lost the battle to Henry VII and Henry Earl of Richmond. And the story is that the crown, was, crown helmet was in a bush, and Lord Stanley took it out of the bush on the battlefield after Richard had been defeated and placed it on Henry, Earl of Richmond's head, and said, you are now King Henry VII. So the story goes. So there's a lot of history in these crowns, and I always think when the king goes to Parliament, he's wearing a lot of history of England and Scotland on his head. Now, as well as the crowns and jewels, we have various silver gilt and gold items, and the largest being the Grand Punch Bowl which weighs a quarter of a ton. That's about the size of it that you're looking at now, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Somebody can't see very well. <laughs> Who can't see very well? <laughs> anyway, here is the Grand Punch Bowl. It... it uh, it contains images of the, a lion and the unicorn of the Royal Coat of Arms. All the, um, all the um, shells and sea creatures coming out of the sea. And then you've got rabbits and squirrels and even flies and all sorts of, so much detail in it. And cherubs, all sorts of cherubs. And uh, it's an amazing piece. It's got a hundred and, it's got... Uh, over 500 separate pieces that can be taken off it when they clean it. I've actually helped the crown jeweller take it out of the case, take it into an ante room, take it all to bits, clean it, and then um, you can ask me about what they, what they clean it with later on. And then put it all back together again. But the most important and impressive thing about this punch bowl to me is it holds 144 bottles of claret or 288 cans of Budweiser. for our American cousins. And I said to Keith Hansen, who was my boss, you know Keith, don't you? And I said to him, I said, if you fill that up for the Christmas party, the staff will empty it. But he never agreed to that, which is such a shame. Because as far as I know, it wasn't used in the last coronation, this last year. It was used at one of the coronation banquets in 53. And there's actually um, the um, ladle which is made of a conch shell, large conch shell, in the shape of a conch shell, and that holds a bottle and a half. They could have given us that, couldn't they? Yeah. So it's an amazing piece. And you always see a large crown around, a crowd around it. Here's a large crown, but that's a large crowd. This is the Imperial Crown of India. It contains 6,004 precious stones, 5,986 diamonds, 10 emeralds, 4 rubies and 4 sapphires. Made by Garrard's, the crown jewellers, for the Delhi Durbar, 12th of December 1911. Delhi had just become the capital of India, and um, King George V went out there as, as uh, king and emperor. Queen Victoria never went to India, though she did have some favourite Indian servants that used to serve her curry at Windsor Castle. And she did, and, and Edward VII went there when he was Prince of Wales on a safari hunting trip. But once they became king, People, the government was worried about letting the monarch go to India for safety reasons. And so he was the only one, George V went out there with Queen Mary. It was a huge success. A quarter of a million of his Indian subjects paid homage to the king. They didn't know who was going to crown him because of the different religions in India. So he just appeared, he put it on himself in the ante room, came out wearing this crown. And it was a huge success and it's never been worn since. It's still in the jewel, jewel house. And it was paid for by the Indian office of the British government, made by Garrards, who were then the crown jewellers. And I did, when, when King Charles came through, I was with him, and, uh, when he was, before he was king, and I remember him looking at it. But uh, I thought he might have had, wanted to use it in the last coronation, but he didn't. So it's a lovely crown. It can't go back to India now because India is a republic. So it sits there as the British crown of India. 
And these are, it's a very nice crown because all the jewels are very symmetrical. But it will never be worn again. Now, somebody mentioned stealing the crown jewels. 6th of May, 1671. There has only ever been one attempt to steal the crown jewels. The crown jewels are not insured. They are priceless. They are very famous. If you broke them up, they wouldn't be worth as much. If you walked into a jeweler's shop with the imperial state crown, they'd know where you got it from. So in, in a way, they're their own insurance policy. But... Uh, Colonel Thomas Blood got very friendly with Talbot Edwards, who was the jewel keeper at the Tower of London. And he lived in the Martin Tower, which is where you have a Crowns and Diamonds exhibition in there now. And the shop was just below there, the jewel house shop. Anyway, he got very friendly, pretended to be a parson, got very friendly with Talbot Edwards, was invited to dinner with two of his accomplices. And uh, one of the accomplices was supposed to be a suitor for Talbot Edwards' daughter. They had dinner in the upper chamber of the Martin Tower and then Colonel Blood said to Mr Edwards, is there any chance we could see the crown jewels down below because we've never seen them before. And being obliging, Mr Edwards says yes, thinking he was a, a parson, took him downstairs into the jewel chamber and then when he got there, Talbot Edwards with his two accomplices said, well I can't see them very well, can you, I mean, is there any chance that you've got the key so you can open up the grill? So obligingly again, Mr Edwards opened the grill and they bashed him over the head and gagged him. And they grabbed the Imperial State Crown, one of the orbs, which one guy stuck down his trousers. There's still a bit of dint in the, in the, the object now. And uh, the um, scepter, which didn't have the first star of Africa, because it hadn't been found then. So, and they ran across through the, in front of the White Tower. The officer of the guard uh, fired a shot. They were apprehended on the wharf. And then um, Colonel Blood said, well, I don't want to speak to any of the authorities at the tower. I think the king, I'd like to see the king himself. So the following day, he came up in front of King Charles II, accused of stealing the crown jewels of England. What do you think happened to him? Anybody? He was what? Had his head off. <laughs> he got a free pardon. Yes, this lady's right at the front here. He was granted a free pardon by King Charles II. Was the king, who was always short of money, Involved in this plot? We don't know. Was it that he thought he was a cheeky Irish chap and he liked him? Or was it because he offered to act as a spy? Because it wasn't long after the restoration of the monarchy. A lot of people in the city of London were still had, had supported the Republic under Oliver Cromwell. And let's be kind to the king and say that it, it's because he offered to act as a spy. So he got his lands restored to him in Ireland and he got a free pardon. But poor old Talbot Edwards, the shot was too much for him and he eventually died a few months later. He'd been promised a, a pension by King Charles II but he never got it. But what he did get was a plaque with his name on in the chapel of St. Peter Advincula. And that's still there today. <laughs> so if you go in the chapel you can see it there. So that's what happened. So nobody's tried to steal them since then. And if they tried to steal them now, it's not on my watch. <laughs> now everybody knows the Tower of London and everybody thinks of it as a place of execution. It was never built as a prison or a place of execution. It was built as a royal palace. But over the years, um, because it was safe to keep people in, um, and, and safe to keep the royal family in, they also thought it would be safe to keep prisoners in. The royal family then moved to more salubrious castles and palaces and didn't really stay at the tower very much. So they started sending people who got the wrong side of the king or the government. They were put on barges. At Westminster came down the River Thames to Traitor's Gate, walked up those famous steps, and some of them didn't leave until they were separated. Their heads were separated from their necks. Most of those that were executed were executed in public on Tower Hill, um, near the memorial to the um, merchant seamen. You can just go to Tower Hill and see the, the execution site. You don't have to pay to go in the Tower of London because that's where they were executed. Only seven people executed within the confines of the Tower of London itself. But the Tower of London has been famous for lots of things. It's been a zoo, it's been a menagerie, which was a zoo, it's been a royal mint, it's been all sorts of things. But people always remember it for these terrible things that happened. And if you go into the chapel of St. Peter Advincula, which I was just talking about then, you will see memorial plaques for Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard, Lady Jane Grey, etc. Prince Albert um, was responsible for employing a man named Anthony Salvin in, Salvin 
in the Victorian era to remedievalize the palace, the, the, the Tower of London. Because by that time, the Georgians had put lots of brick buildings and all sorts up, and it looked a mess. And Prince Albert thought it looked like it should do, like it was in the medieval period. It's not cheating, it's just making it look like it originally was, which is what it looks like now. So they rebuilt some of the towers and rebuilt the crenellations, they did all sorts of things. And they found that the floor in the chapel wasn't very good, so they dug up the bodies and tried to identify who had been hurriedly buried there and then put up these lovely plaques for these very famous people who weren't treated very well, although they, most of them had been royalty, and they weren't treated very well, they were just shoved higgledy-piggledy under the floor. And the worst one of all was Lady Jane Grey. I'm going to read this out because this is a very good description of her execution. An extract of the Tower of London from within by Major General Sir George Younghusband, who was keeper of um, the Crown Jewels in the late 19th and early 20th century. One of the most pathetic and beautiful ladies who have come to the block at the Tower of London was Lady Jane Grey, a quiet, unassuming, devout lady. Her misfortune was to be the offspring of an ambitious father, Henry Grey, Duke of Suffolk. Her royal cousin was the sickly young King Edward VI. On July the 10th, 1553, after the boy King's death, she was brought in state to the Tower and entered it as Queen of England. Though not yet crowned, she walked into the Great Hall of the Tower of London, taking her place on the throne. After a brief reign of just nine days, this is where we get the phrase a nine-day wonder from, she was informed that her reign was over and Princess Mary was now Queen. And she received this news with a sigh of relief. And there's every reason for conjecturing that Queen Mary meant to spare the life of this gentle lady. But her father, the Duke of Suffolk, became involved in another rebellion, that headed by Sir Thomas Wyatt. Protestant rebellion against uh, Protestant rebellion. Jane knew nothing of it, but it sealed her fate, and Queen Mary consented at last to her execution. And February the 12th, 1554, was the day. At the execution, the hangman knelt down and asked her to forgive him, which she did most willingly. Then he willed her to stand upon the straw, which doing she saw the block, and then she said, I pray you dispatch me quickly. And then she knelt down saying, Will you take it off before I lay me down? And the hangman answered her, No, madam. She tied the hanky about her eyes and feeling for the block. What shall I do, she said, where is it? And one of the witnesses guided her head upon the block. And Jane stretched forth her body and said, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so she died, a brave and gallant lady than whom no man could have borne himself braver and few so brave, she lies in the grave of the chapel of St. Peter Advincula in the Tower of London. Her epitaph is a simple word Jane, engraved so deeply in the ancient walls of the Beecham Tower that after four centuries it stands as clear now as it did then. Lady Jane Grey uh, was only 17 years of age. Had she been prepared to become a, a Catholic, then Mary would have... Um, spared her life, but she didn't, and she was very brave. So the people executed within the town, Lord Hastings, June 1483, Anne Boleyn, May 19, 1536, Margaret Countess of Salisbury, May 27, 1540, Catherine Howard, February 13, 1542, Lady Jane Grey, February 12, 1554, and Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, February 25, 1601. Robert Devereux had the honour of being executed within the tower because he was trying to organise an uprising against Queen Elizabeth I. So, and also royal royalty as well, may have caused trouble in the city. So that's why they were executed in private. I watch some of these movies and quite often they see people being executed in the tower when I know they were actually executed on Tower Hill in public with big crowds. There we are. Ravens were at the tower. They're always everybody likes to see them when they go there. Ravens used to hang around the tower in the medieval times because they eat carrion. They like meat. There's plenty of bodies for them to peck at at the tower, and they were indigenous to the southeast of England because you had the small city of London, just a few little villages, tower hamlets, tiny little villages, there, and nothing else really. And so it was, it was not far from the country at all. In later years, of course, they have to keep. Because King Charles decreed that if the ravens ever leave the tower, England and the monarchy would crumble. 
So they always keep at least six there. Some they breed at the Tower. Some they get from Cornwall, Devon, Cornwall, Scotland, Lake District, where we still have ravens in this country. And they have a raven master looking after them. When I worked there, I used to park my car on the wharf and I used to walk up here to the, the ruins, just past the ruins of the wardrobe tower to the jewel house up there. And one morning at half past seven, I was walking up that hill, nobody about, and I heard this voice. It went, morning. <laughs> so I looked round, I couldn't see anybody. So I walked on, I walked on. Morning, it said. And it was a raven talking to me on the, on the top of this wall. I thought, my goodness. I didn't even go out for a drink last night. You know. And uh, I went in and saw some of my colleagues who'd arrived early uh, in the jewel house. And um, we often used to gather outside the jewel house. You've seen, you should see, isn't it? And um, they said, yes, there is one. that's has picked up this guy's voice. I can't remember. Do you remember him? I do. I can't, I can't remember his name. Sometimes, yeah. He was there for a long while. Anyway, they picked up his voice. Now, to keep the ravens at the tower, they clip their wings so they don't fly away. It doesn't do any harm because the wings will go back. And if the wings go back too far, and sometimes they just take off and fly away. And that one, and just a few weeks after I had this, this incident, I, I was told one had flown away and was last seen perched over a pub in Shoreditch. And I thought maybe it's got a job there, you know, sitting in a tree over this pub. And it might, might have just been saying, last orders, last orders. We'll never know, do we? Will we? The public and the things they say. This is me looking a lot younger in the 1990s. There's the White Tower behind me. Normally we worked in the jewel house. Sometimes we were sent over to the White Tower. This morning I was sent over to the White Tower because the tubes weren't running very well. People were getting there late. And it was, uh, I went to, right to the top floor. If anybody's been to the top floor of the White Tower, if the windows open, it was a nice summer's day. You can see what used to be the old Greater London Authority building. That's not, it's not there anymore. And then you could see the... Um, hills and then the flats, council flats in South London, then the hills rising up and you can see the radio mast at Crystal Palace. And I saw this American gentleman looking inquisitively at this radio mast, you see. I thought he's going to come and ask me a question in a minute. So he came over and he said, excuse me sir. I said, yes. He said, is that the Eiffel Tower I can see from here? <laughs> so I said, no sir, it's not the Eiffel Tower. Um, we are facing south, though, so it can't be Blackpool Tower either. So I said, it's the Radio Master Crystal Palace. Anyway, that, we had a chat. And then the people, the staff started arriving in the White Tower. I went back to the Jewel House. I was on the post one, which is the front door of the Jewel House. And this guy comes over again, saying, he's following me, this bloke. And he came over. He said, I see that you've got ER on your uniform. And it's all over all their uniforms. I said, yes, sir. He said, what does it stand for? I said, er. Uh. He said, no, it doesn't. He said, it does. I said, it does? Her Majesty. He said, no, can you tell me? I said, all right, sir. It stands for Elizabeth Regina, sir. He said, gee, I knew that, but I'd forgotten her second name. <laughs> so it was lunchtime. So I went and had a sandwich from one of those lovely little shops on the wharf. And I was coming back, and I passed a group of people... Um, being uh, given a guided tour by one of the yeoman warders. They're very good, those guided tours, so you should go on one of them. And um, I'm trying to think of his name. Anyway, he'll come to me in a minute. Anyway, he was giving a talk, and he said, um, Ladies and gentlemen, down Water Street here is where the Royal Mint used to be. All the coins of England were produced here in the Tower of London. And, uh, by, um, and the master of the Royal Mint in, at one time was Sir Isaac Newton, the famous scientist and mathematician. He said, can anybody tell me um, what Sir Isaac Newton was famous for? And there's this guy again, you see, right at the back. He says, I know, he said, he invented gravity. <laughs> and Simon, Simon Dodd, the human water, said, yes, he invented gravity. Another great British invention. <laughs> uh, then I walked along, there's another human water giving a tour outside the chapel of um, St. Peter at Winkle, and he was saying, all the, uh, Catherine Howard, and she had these various affairs. This is why she, had a, she was executed on the, the orders of King Henry VIII. And this little girl who'd been going around with them all the time, putting her hand up and asking questions and making points. The little girl put her hand up. She said, yes, my dear, have you something to say? She said, yes, I do. She said, my daddy had an affair. <laughs> he said, and he got caught. And no sooner had she said that than she was dragged away 
by our beloved parents, perhaps not to have a, another day out for a few weeks. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will answer questions in a few minutes, but thank you very much for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed it.